Hello, grade 10, and welcome to another edition of our PowerPoint presentations to do with production. So we're in the second unit, Functions of Business, and we spoke last time about production, and we spoke about input uh, resources, we spoke about transformation activities, and also outputs. Today we're going to go a little further into what production is. First thing that you need to do is download the handout, it looks like this, and you will have seen this handout, it's posted on our class page have a copy open beside you, or you can have a copy, um, a printed out copy and, and fill it in as we go along. So what is production? Uh, what is the production process? So question one, what is the ultimate target of the production process? And the answer is, it is to make goods or services that will meet the demands and the needs of customers. It is to make goods and services that will meet the demands and the needs of customers. So just a review from the last PowerPoint presentation that we had, we're talking about inputs to outputs. And I've listed a number of businesses here. For each of the businesses, can you identify what the main output of the business is? So the first one, brewery, well, the output would be good tasting beer. And do publisher, hotel, insurance company, and ECHS. And again, you will see on the handout sheet, there will be a list there that you can write down your answers. Okay, so we're gonna do a little bit of application here. On your handout sheet, I would like you to fill in what process would you use from start to finish to make a hamburger? So imagine a McDonald's or a Harvey's, an A&W, even a Tim Hortons. What is the process that these businesses use from start to finish to make a hamburger? I guess Tim Hortons doesn't make hamburgers, but the same type of idea. And then think about what factors of production are involved. So what are the input resources? What are all the inputs? And what transformation activity is necessary? So what is happening? So it's the same type of thing if you think about the factory videos that we watched last time, the ones about the hot dog. Um, if you think about this, in this instance, you're actually making a, a hamburger. What is the process that you use? So this slide deals with a little bit of um, review just so we can refresh our memory as far as what is the production process. On the top you'll see that there's three boxes, those are the red boxes, the inputs, land, capital, human resources, and entrepreneurship. And we talked about those being economic resource inputs. The transformation activities, we have four of them that we talked about last time, manufacture, supply, service, and transport. Again, if you're unsure, just refer to your notes from last time. And then the, what is the outputs? Well, there's two different outputs. Usually it's saleable, goods and services, things can be sold. And also another output would be valuable information. If you go online or if you look through some textbooks about um, production, sometimes economists divide the input resources into six different ones. So they take land and they divide it into two things, natural resources and raw materials. And we did talk about that in our last lesson as well. Then they'll have capital as a third, human resources, which are employees and labor as their fourth. And then as a fifth, they often put in information. We have lumped information together with entrepreneurship or management. It is the, it is the entrepreneurship and the management who usually has the information that they need to take all the other resources and to then uh, output sellable goods and services. So this is what we wanted to, I just want to refer to this or make sure that I covered this with you as well, because I know that if you were to go look some of this up online, you will see that there are six inputs. And I just wanna make sure that you didn't get too confused by that. And then economist groups, I put them together. They have then land. Um, you can see that in the bottom right-hand side of the slide. Land is natural resources and raw materials, capital, human, and entrepreneurship or management, which covers the information part as well. So there were four stages of the production. There's purchasing, processing, quality control, and grading. And we will go through these different stages individually and write down some more information about them. For question number four, can you just list the four different stages? So the first stage is purchasing. In the process of production, a business or firm must purchase all the rest of the necessary resources for production. This includes land resources. It includes raw materials or natural resources. And then these are transformed by other economic resources. Again, we call that transformation activities into the end product, which is outputs, which are sellable goods and services.
So very often there's a purchasing department, uh, an agent, a buyer, or if it's a small business, the owner does most of the purchasing. There are two things, and this is in question number five, there are two things that a purchaser considers when making decisions. They first want to think about the quality of the raw materials being purchased and also the price of the raw materials being purchased. And very often there is a bit of a, um, a, bit of a bar or a line graph as far as when is it good enough quality to produce the type of good and service that they want to produce with at the PowerPoint where it's possible to do so and to still make money on it. So this is what you want to write down for question number five. If you think about Willingas, for example, they have a purchasing department and people in the purchasing department at Willingas will do exactly this. They will um, scout out and try to find the best quality raw materials that they can find for the best price and what is most suitable to the product that they are producing. In order to make this a little bit more real to you, can you please download what's called the Purchasing Activity. You will find that on our class page. It will be underneath the journal entry in the, uh, in the section. Download that and complete that. You might need a calculator for this. It's just a matter of understanding that when you are, when you are purchasing more expensive raw materials, then your price might be higher for the, for the good or service that you are selling, or you might have less of a profit. So fill that out and complete that before you move on. So after a company has purchased all of the raw materials or natural resources required and they have their capital resources in place, their factories and machines, etc., and they have some human resources in place, we're talking here about labor and employees, then they begin the process of processing. Conversion processing means to convert one item into the other, question seven. The resources that do transformation, again, we'll see a list. You can see in the little handout, the little graphic underneath the picture, can show you how this happens. Raw materials and components come into a warehouse, which sends it to production, at which place it is produced, and then it goes in for a quality check. Again, we saw this watching the video on... Um, sorry, watching the video on hot dogs and on lipstick, then it goes to not back to the warehouse often, comes out as a finished product, and then is shipped or distribu distributed to a supplier or to a retailer. The other thing that we need to talk about through processing is refinement. Very often you'll hear that term when it comes to processing. Refining means to convert or to transform a raw material into a semi-finished good. Uh, often the semi-finished good is then reused again as an input resource in a different in a different way. So an example of this would be sugarcane. When sugarcane is refined, it gets refined into actual sugar. Um, often people will use sugar to make other finished goods and services. A bit more review, review about transformation activities. It is useful to categorize different types of transformation into four different categories. Manufacturing, transport, supply, and service. Can you list those in question nine? You do not need to write down the definition of them if you already understand it. Just list the four different types. Using the chart on your handout, um, can you identify the resources? So write down the inputs, write down the type of transformation activity or process, and write down the finished good or service in each of the following operations. So for the first one, refining steel, you might have identified such inputs such as materials, energy, machines, equipment, building, and people. For assembling cars, the inputs used by a car assembly plant include the raw materials, the components needed to build the car, equipment, building, labor, and energy such as electricity. You might have also included as an input the transformation process of ideas and of skills and of information. You might also notice that halfway down the list, the activities change from the production of goods and services a little bit more to the production of sorry, from the production of goods, a little bit more to the provision of services. In the case of car design, the principal inputs are ideas, and the outputs are the materials used to communicate the finished idea. Those materials would include things like blueprints or computer models. Fill out the rest of the chart. 
So thinking about the chart that you just filled out, there were different types of inputs. You would have noticed inputs such as raw materials. And then you would have also noticed inputs that were used in the transformation activity itself. So we need to kind of distinguish between the two. Question 10 asks, how are inputs classified and explained? You'll find that in the top left of this slide, some inputs are used up in the process of creating goods or service. These are often the raw materials. And others play a part in the creation process are not used up. To distinguish between these two, input resources are classified as, and that would be the answer to A and to B, transformed resources and transforming resources. Please also include an example of each. We have discussed in a previous lesson also that inputs include different types of both transformed and transforming resources. There's basically three types of resources that are being transformed in the operation. Things like materials, the physical inputs to the process, the information is being processed or used up in the process, and customers. And this goes back to those four different transformation activities. We've got manufacture, we've got supply, and we've got service and transport. Now, many people think of operations mainly about the transformation of materials or components into finished products, like the transformation of all the different car parts into the finished car part. But organizations that produce goods and services transform resources. Many are concerned mainly with the transformation of information. And we also talked about this a little bit last time. A consultant firm, an accountant firm, any of these things, uh, ECHS, a school, they're concerned about the transformation of information. So information can be a transformed good or service. So I've missed question 11, which was actually on the previous slide. List three types of inputs or of transformation activities. These are materials, information, and customers. And that brings us to transforming resources. Question 12, there are two types of transfer, transforming resources. The first one is humans. These are the people who are involved in the transformation process and support it. They can be direct employees, or they could also be contracted to supply services to the organization to do that. They are described as labor or employees. The next one, question 13, is capital resources. These are the facilities of the organization. It includes the building and the machinery and the equipment. Um, they also might include the electricity. And operations vary greatly in the mix of capital and labor to, that make up their inputs. Sometimes there's highly op automated operations such as big factories. They rely a lot on capital. And then there's other organizations or businesses that rely a lot on labor. And there's not too much capital involved in their business. Please fill this chart out in your, on your handout. You will notice as you go through and identify the principal inputs used by each of the following organizations, as well as their principal outputs. So an example, the first one, restaurant, the transformed resources of a restaurant include food and drink. And it's transforming resources, so transforming activity and the resources used for that would include things like equipment such as cookers, refrigerators, tables and chairs, as well as the chefs and the waiters. So what actual transformation activity is that and what inputs are being used? The output being quality food and drink, as well as quality service. For a university, it's a little bit different. Uh, the transformed resources included include students and knowledge. So that would be the output. The output is students who are knowledgeable. So what is the input into this and what are the transforming uh, activities? Uh, some of the resources used are the lecturers, the tutors, the uh, support staff, the teaching staff, and then things like classrooms and books and instructional materials. So fill in this chart and do that on your handout, please. Question 14 asks, what is quality control? Well, this is a process through which a business seeks to ensure that the product quality is maintained or improved and the manufacturing errors are reduced or eliminated. And it requires a business to create an environment in which both the management and the employees strive for perfection. And there's a lot of different things that can be done to make sure that quality control is sufficient, can train personnel, can create kind of benchmark or standards for testing, and can also check to see if things can be done better. 
One of the quality standards that's implemented by the Canadian government and accepted by the Canadian government and also all over the world is something called the International Organization for Standardization, the ISO. They first gained popularity in Europe and then they spread to America in the 1990s. And it is actually a network of national standards across the world and it is across 163 countries and it is coordinated by a central um, organization in Geneva. Watch this video that explains a little bit more about it. We live in an amazing world full of incredible opportunities and endless possibilities. But it can also be a complex and overwhelming place. When things don't work as they should, it often means that standards are absent. But when ISO standards are applied, life is just so much richer. ISO standards help to make the world a safer, cleaner, and more efficient place. From food safety to computers. From healthcare to new technologies. There are many challenges facing our environment, economy, and society. ISO can make a positive difference to all our lives, utilizing a wealth of international experience and wisdom. In today's ever-changing world, ISO standards help create growth, open up global markets, and make trade fairer, including for developing countries. ISO standards can help tackle global challenges like climate change, road safety, energy, and social responsibility. ISO standards touch almost everything we do, keeping us connected and entertained, making us more productive, more creative, sharing ideas, promoting innovation, and keeping us safe and healthy. ISO is the world's largest developer of voluntary international standards. With over 18,000 standards for nearly every aspect of technology and business, for over 60 years, a network of standards bodies in 163 countries, working in partnership around the world and right here at home. ISO builds confidence for today, for tomorrow, for tomorrow, and for the future. And for the future. So question 15 will ask, or did ask, what are um, three things that ICO standards do well, the three things, if you didn't catch it, one is that it increases the quality of goods and services of products. The second one is that it increases trade. And the third one is that it makes things, uh, it makes globalization easier for countries. It's easier for countries to exchange products if they're all set to the same standard. That way, when you get, let's say, a soccer ball that was made in, I don't know, in Colombia or something like that, then you know that that soccer ball has reached the standards that it is a safe product even though it was put together in Colombia it's a safe product for people in America to, to to use. Question 16 asks what does standardization mean? So this refers to the process of setting up basic measures or standards to which products must conform and make sure that the goods actually produced are produced in a way that they meet these standards. Not just the finished product, but also the transformation activity, the processing activity, that these activities also adhere to certain standards as far as the amount of carbon they put into the environment or things like that. The next question is what is grading? Grading is a process of sorting individual units of a product into well-defined classes or grades of quality. And then finally, the last question is list three food products that are graded. If you're not sure, if you can't think of this, go ask your mom or your dad, whoever does the groceries in the house. They should probably know the graded products because it will say so in the grocery store when you buy these products. And this final slide explains a little bit more the advantages of standardization and grading. This is our question 19. So list a couple of different advantages, read through the five different ones that are listed here, put them together and list at least two advantages to having standardization or grading when it comes to goods and services. That's it for today. Thank you for watching.